we'd like to. Where's the sand there? We'd like to welcome everyone. Amen. There's David right here. Nah. It ain't working. Oh, it's not? Nah. It's not working. There we go. We have power. <laughs> it was off, no, it was plugged into power the output, the not the you. input. Uh, well, we'd like to welcome everyone. Well, that's what the world's doing. They're, go, they're going uh, in where they should be going out and going out where they should be going in. And with that having been said, our introductory song for today is a song that goes all the way back to 1868. Fanny Crosby, a dear blind soul who wrote over 8,500 uh, hymns for the church, uh, she had uh, visited a prison. And what ended up happening was um, she heard one of the prisoners as she was leaving, praying to God, asking God not to pass him by. And that inspired her to write this song, Pass Me Not My Gentle Savior. Now, I will have to say that Fanny Crosby was a Methodist. And as everybody knows, Methodists are not believers in Calvinism. And so... Calvinists believe that you God chooses. God chooses. He picks and chooses. So in this song, if you just hear the title of it, it sounds like when you go, when you point out your finger and you start choosing, don't pass me by. That's what it sounds like. So she got a lot of heat for this. Bet. You know, uh, but that uh, when you really go into it, it's uh, and you really think about it, when it comes to gospel music, there's a lot of erroneous expressions that may be said in gospel music and hymns that are from a human perspective. And so it still, it, it doesn't discredit the song. Uh, she basically put herself in the place of that suffering and disregarded prisoner when she wrote this song. That's how that prisoner felt. He was where he was at he didn't have any fortune in life. It didn't seem like he was blessed in any way. And so we always think of this term and pass me not my gentle Savior. We always think of it in terms of salvation. But it could just be in the simple plea of blessings. Lord, you're a good God. You're coming down and you're blessing mankind. You said you would open up the floodgates and give us so much that we wouldn't have room to take it, right? right? Pass me not, Lord. We don't have to look at it in the view of salvation. It could be in the view of many other things, the blessings of God. And uh, truly this song has been an inspiring song. And uh, it's something that uh, we, we want to ask the Lord. If we need healing, Lord, pass me not. We need finances for our ministry or for our own personal finances uh, because things seem to be tight. Lord, pass me not. If there's a getting ready to be a, a whole lot of the harvest is, is getting ready to go and people are going to start coming to church and, and ministers are going to start getting busy, Lord, pass me not. You know, pass me not, my gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass. While on others thou art called 
do not pass me by. Let me at thy throne of mercy find a sweet relief. Kneeling there in deep contrition, help my unbelief. earth but in the universe your eye is upon every believer your eye is upon every unbeliever your eye is upon every demonic spirit your eye is upon every angel we know that you see all we know that you know what we need before we even realize it and that's why we seek you, Father. We seek your attention. You know what this ministry needs. You know in our preparation of what we are going to do next Saturday. You, knew, you know we need people to come. You know we need people to purchase the things that we have to offer. You know it. And that's why we're seeking you for it. Make miracles. Yes. Make make a flood, Father, a flood of, of blessing. But we don't ask that selfishly. We ask it because we're doing this for you and what we feel you have called us to do. So, Father, as we go into our worship service today, there are many who are not here today for various reasons. I'm praying right now that you will touch them. I'm praying, Father, that if it's a spiritual reason, a physical reason, whatever it is, that you will heal it. But I'm also asking, Father, that if there's someone who just don't feel like it, you will put a spirit of conviction upon them, and they will at least turn on YouTube and watch it. Bless us, Lord. Bless the word that will be spoken today. For truly, Father, it was your Holy Spirit who gave it. Yes. We give you glory, honor, and praise for all. In Jesus' name. Bless that wonderful name. Thank you. 
According to Revelation, to write our name in his book, the Lamb's Book of Life. When does that name get written? When you become a Christian. Yes. And specifically, there's a lot of people who profess. The problem with a lot of evangelical Christians out here is they think just because you repeat after me the sinner's prayer, now you're saved. It's the day that the Spirit comes in and takes over who you are. Right. Amen. And you have become born again. Amen. Not just the day you might go up to the altar and say a sinner's prayer. Because if that didn't happen that day, guess what? You're still in that same boat. The day that the Spirit, that gift of the Spirit comes upon you and makes you a new creature. That is the day that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, it's written there, but can it be erased? Yes. 
Yeah, it can be erased. There might be several of us. I know there's a lot of Christians out there who's probably been, it's been erased three or four times, but thank God and thank Jesus it's, it's, it's there now. Right. Amen. Well, this next song is a praise song, but it's, it's also a declaration song. He wrote my name. It's an old southern gospel song. Let's see if we can sing it. The blessed Savior wrote my name when I was born again. He wrote it when He saved my soul. He wrote that I had made my right civil sinful wrong. He wrote my name on heaven's road. He wrote my name, my name, way up in glory land. He saved my soul from sin and shame. I shall never, shall never forget that day. The blessed Savior wrote my name. Be no stranger when I reach my home in glory land. My name is in the book of life. The blessed Savior wrote it when he saved my soul. He saved my soul from sin and strife. He wrote my name, my name way up in glory land. He saved my soul, saved my soul from sin and shame. I never shall, no, I never shall forget the day. The blessed Savior wrote my name. If I should live a thousand years upon this earth below, I never could forget the day that Jesus wrote my name within that blessed book of life and took my many sins away. He wrote my name way up in glory land. He saved my soul from sin and shame. I never shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my name. He wrote my name way up in glory land. He saved my soul from sin and shame. I never shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote he wrote my name way up in glory land. He saved my soul from sin and shame. I never shall forget the day. The blessed Savior wrote my name. He wrote my name way up in glory land. He saved my soul from sin and shame I never shall forget the day the blessed Savior wrote my name He wrote my name He wrote my name Oh thank you Jesus You wrote my name And now I'm never gonna forget the blessed Savior Oh, my name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Your name you, is written in the Lamb's book of life. Thank you, Lord. People are all concerned in this world about whether or not they're going to get a tombstone with their name wrote on it. But you know what? I have no problem with a tombstone with a name wrote on it. But if your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Amen. your existence right. really never mattered. Amen. We want our name written Amen. there first. Yes. And we want it to stay wrote, on, wrote there. Yes, Lord. Let's enter into reflection. One of the very encouraging psalms when you're dealing with the demons of this world, you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with feeling hopeless and alone. 
Psalm 91 is a, a beautiful psalm that really shows what, the, what God will do. He's not just a, a deist God who's up there, who's not really concerned with what we're dealing with. and He doesn't put himself, even though he's in another world, so to speak, he doesn't separate himself from the interest of what we go through. He sees the turmoil. He sees the pain. He sees the suffering. And he condescends to reach down and carry us through it. And that's described in the 91st Psalm. Let's read, let's sing this song. The name of this song is On Eagle's Wings. You who dwell in the shelter of the Lord. Who abide in his shadow for life. Say to the Lord, my refuge, my rock in whom I trust. And he will raise you up on me. you and famine will bring you no fear under his wings your refuge is faithfulness your shield he will raise you up on me
how we need that. How we need to be raised up in a fallen world. We're going to call uh, Lady Pyle to come forward with today's announcements. Praise the Lord. God Praise. is good. Amen. Amen. Praise the it Lord. It says, uh, you know that song that we just got done singing, just touched my heart, knowing that we are in his hands, in yes. all of his hands. No matter what struggle you're going through mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, nobody knows what you're going through, but God knows. Yes. You know? And, um, but uh, God is just so good. Yes. So good. Yes. You know, there's no one greater than him. There's no one mightier than him. And uh, we are just so blessed. And we are so grateful. All the things that the Lord is using, this small little mustard seed that he's using. You know, one seed at a time, right? <laughs> but praise God. Praise God. Well, um, I just wanted to remind you all that uh, this Saturday we're going to be having a yard sale. And it's going to be at Jonas's uh, store outside. And uh, I don't know the address of it, but uh, maybe later on when we put the video up, we can put the address on the bottom of it. So we know the right. We always pass it and we know where it is. But the address. Mercy store. The Mercy store. store. Oh, oh, no, yeah. Mercy store. The Mercy yeah. store. Yes. Yeah. Everybody needs store. Mercy. The track store? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They take a lot of Okay. But, um, yeah, so this Saturday, we uh, it's it's a way for us to go and be in the neighborhood and evangelize. I know we're having a yard sale. It's not about the money. It's about the soul. You Amen. know, each and every soul that comes there, we are praying that whoever the Lord puts in their heart to stop, and as they look at the products, they also look up towards Jesus. Yeah. You know? And that's that's our goal. It's not about the stuff. It's about God. Yes, and doing amen. His word and sharing the word and ministering to the people and letting them know that they're loved. These people, mm -hmm. some of them, they, mm -hmm. they don't feel loved. Or they, they don't think they're worthy to be loved. You know, that's how enemy works. Mm -hmm. I know that's how the enemy worked in me. You know? and uh, But uh, God is good. Yes, yes. And He's a good, good Father. You know, and he's always there with us. And um, also, we are getting ready for revival, mm -hmm. and it's going to be on September 9th, 10th, and 11th. It's going to be at Cockeridge, the park down there, and we're going to be giving the addresses out soon. And uh, we the, don't need the addresses. It's the, the it's Carthage the, Elementary School. Yeah, there's a park right there. Mm -hmm. 9th, 10th, and 11th. Of September. After the week after the week. Oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah. It and it's going to start at uh, 6 and end at 8.30. We, uh, we will need help with, uh, you know, coming early and uh, setting up with the food and uh, uh, we, um, the sound. sound system. And uh, most importantly, during this time, while we are getting ready for the revival, please, if you get one or two days in, fast and pray for this. Yes, yes. Get whatever time you get, it's very important to pr uh, pray and fast. And, uh, yeah, and um, seek God's guidance and uh, pray for the souls that will be coming in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, I know Sister Donna and Brother Rob has been going out on Tuesday mornings out there at the courthouse in Carthage. And they've been praying with people in. And you'll be surprised how many people would stop and ask for mm -hmm. prayer. Because people know there's a higher power. Yes. You know? But sometimes in the midst of the storm and midst of everything, they forget. But once you, you are out there and they see the sign, when they see the people, then it reminds them that they're not alone. Amen. Amen. So, so just keep on praying and don't get discouraged. Just keep on pressing forward. Because God knows our heart and He knows what we're doing. We, whatever we do, let us not do it in flesh. Yes. Let us do it in spirit Amen. and love. You know, yes. we can't do anything without Him. Amen. You know, and um, 
And Grace and Faith will be starting their school on August 16th, and I know uh, Renee and Charlie will be starting soon, and the kids are going back to school. So pray for our children yes. Yes. with, uh, you know, the enemy tries to attack them. You know, a home school or public school, wherever they go, they, uh, we are just praying that the Holy Spirit will be in com com complete control over their mind, body, heart, and soul, and that they will know the God that we serve. You know? Amen. And, uh, so just uh, keep on praying for that. And uh, we have a lot of prayer requests. And uh, as we all know that uh, um, on Wednesdays we have Bible study. And uh, we are in Book of John right now. So it's good. It's good. It's good to go back to basics. And that's what the name of our revival is too, going back to the basics. And uh, so... Uh, it's just so good to just meditate on the Word of God. And just, it's amazing when you read the verse by verse and uh, the Holy Spirit just starts moving and revealing you the things that you thought. You know, you can read that verse 10, 20 times and sometimes the Lord just <coughs> right touches then. you right Amen. there. And yes. you're like, whoa, I never saw that before. <laughs> <laughs> but God is good. That's right. You know? Amen. And um, we are uh, praying for our brothers and sisters in Africa. Yeah. I know they're still on lockdown, so we are praying for them. And, you know, and uh, Jehovah Jireh, our Lord is our provider. Yeah. So in good times, in bad times, we lift up our voice and give him praise and glory and honor because we know who holds our tomorrow, right? Amen. Yeah. And... Uh, um, we continue to pray for Sister Toy and her family in California, and uh, Sister Dixie, and uh, we have a lot of prayer requests down here. We'll be praying for uh, Sister Judy, praise God, we'll be seeing her in Bible study and in the house of the Lord uh, Sunday, and uh, I, she's just precious woman of God, and she's full of joy, and it's amazing, yeah. She, she's a grandma for sure. Yeah, yeah she's a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, we, we are just so blessed that uh, Sister Judy is doing good and she's recovering good and God is with her, you know. And uh, I want to say yeah. too also a Carol. Yes. The one that was here. Yeah. We need to lift her up, keep lifting her up in prayer. Yeah. Because we yeah. love her and. And we know she moved back to California, but we need to keep lifting her up in prayer. Yeah, so, uh, just keep on praying for Sister Carol. And I know she she's having some uh, problems right now, but God is good, and God got her. Yes. And uh, she is loved, and we miss her. And uh, she but, had a birthday three days ago. Yeah, she turned 87. Happy birthday, <laughs> belated birthday, Carol. Happy birthday, too. Yeah. But uh, God is good. Yes. Like I said, you know, when you feel down, God is with you. You know, so don't give up. Just keep on pressing forward. Amen. And uh, we are praying. We continue to pray for uh, Kate for healing over her body and um, just praying she will be getting yes, her surgery know. done. So, so we are just praying that you know we already start praying for you know the surgeons whoever is going to be performing the yes, surgery ma that, you know, God will order their hands and mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are praying for Dylan and uh, Sister Glinda. I keep her in prayer with healing over her body and Brother Jimmy and uh, Aaron. Aaron has been going through a lot with health issues. So yeah. just, uh, and uh, Brother Travis and uh, Nisha and the kids, just pray for them. And uh, pray for my family, pray for Jay's family, and Amen. and we are we are just so grateful and thankful that we serve an amazing God. Yes. And mm -hmm. just just keep everybody in prayer because we all need prayer, and we all need that time with the Lord. And that'll be it. Amen.
Hi, everybody. This is uh, the communion that we're leading. But I also want to say hi to all my African friends who I know are watching. <laughs> they hear from me all week <laughs> on their good old messenger on Facebook, but it's always nice to say hi when you're standing in front of them in person, right? Yeah. And I want to... I want to repeat this thing that I have for the prayer over the wine and the bread. The sacrament is a memorial of our Lord's death on the cross, and it is more than that. The name Eucharist adds the resurrection to the crucifixion. It is the risen Christ whom we meet at the altar, and the whole sacramental service is an act of gratitude for Christ born, Christ crucified, Christ risen, and Christ ascended. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just pray right now over this, Lord, that we do this in every view with a whole heart, with all our spirit, all our, our, our being inside us, Lord. I pray that you would open it up to the depths of our soul, Lord, that when we do this, we do this in unity with you and faith, Lord. We do all this in thy name. Amen. Amen. In this bread that we take in remembrance of the body he sacrificed on the cross. Amen. Keep smelling the toast off. Make me hungry. <laughs> bread of life, life everlasting, in Jesus' name. Good morning, everyone. You were get ready for the spotlight. There's a lot of things that were spoken in this in this music. You know, as he was, we was talking about the music and stuff that we were singing, and the word says, "Pass me not by."
in our lives, we go through things. You know, the devil tries to tear us apart. He tries to tear us down. And as you you think about where you get sometimes in your in your life with the things that are coming against you, it makes you want to give up sometimes. I know we've all felt that way. I've had one of those weeks. You know, I go through things. And for a moment, sometimes I feel like giving up. But then the Spirit comes to me and says, Hey, wait. My Word says you'll go through these things. And you know, thank God He is here with me. Amen. Thank God His Spirit is with me. Sometimes they're real tough. And as I go through the things in life and in health and family and children, you know, sometimes things get overbearing. And sometimes we can get out of place. But as I was studying this morning and reading, the Lord was speaking to me about different things. I want to open your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And, and as we... We sang them songs. Everything was spoken right out of what I'm getting ready to speak and read for you. Listen, I'm going to do a little bit of reading. It says, let's go to Romans chapter 8 and 1. It says, Therefore there is no condemnation of those which you are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. What happens when we get upset? What happens when we... Get angry. Our flesh rises up inside of us. You know, what happens when we get discouraged? We lose faith in the one who keeps us. Our flesh tears us down. We war in the battle daily with our flesh. And that's what we need to watch. That's where we need to persevere. That's what we need to keep loud. Sean come this morning just as a, a, a reminder of what we're talking about right here. Sean had been in his home when me and Pastor Jonas had gone there to pray for his girlfriend. A demonic force had taken her over. And the Lord had spoke to me to go and cast that spirit off her. And he spoke to me right out loud in my home, just as clear as a bell. Christ said, well, just go on over there and cast it off, Father. I heard the word just clear, and I started laughing in the spirit. My wife, in the other side of the house, heard me laughing, knew what it was, knew I was laughing in the spirit of God. So he noticed me go over there to pray with her. And as we were doing, Sean seen something come out of his girlfriend in the spiritual sense. That shook him. He recognized something different. He knew that God had moved in his girlfriend. So when we got done, she didn't even know we were there. She said, where did y'all come from? When she came to 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes later, she said, who are y'all? What are you doing here? She didn't even know we had came there to pray for her. That's how much God had took away from her in the spirit. In the demons that were on her. So, John, over the years, had talked to me a couple times about that. This morning, called me, told me he had a child. I said, praise the Lord. Couldn't be here today because he's working. But he said, Jeff, I was sleeping in my car the other night, the other evening, and I looked out the window. He said, I seen this black demon sitting out there in the tree, sitting on a branch. And he's sitting there with his arms crossed. He said, and in his arms was a dagger, a white dagger. And he was looking at me with his white eyes. And he was sitting there on that limb. And he said, I thought to myself, that looked like the same thing that come out of a shell. 
That same thing I remembered years ago that I'd seen when y'all prayed for her. He said, I said, Lord, in the name of Jesus, let not that demon come unto me, is what he said, right out of his own mouth. And I said, see, Sean, without you even realizing, you spoke into existence God's hand to move and take that demon. He said, as soon as I said that, that demon turned his head away from me and looked the other way. So the, the words were spoken out of his mouth, the Spirit of God had, had turned that demon away for a moment. Just like today, we have the power when we get in situations in our life, we have the power to turn that spirit of offense, that spirit of hurt, that spirit of hate, that spirit of anger, all these things that come up, we have that power to turn it away. Amen. But do we? At that moment? Or do we feed into it? Sometimes it's easy to let the devil beat you up and feed into what he's wanting to do. But the Word says, turn from it. Right then. Don't wait. Say, Lord, forgive me if I was angry. Forgive me if I spoke wrong. Forgive me if I looked at something wrong. Forgive me if I did something wrong. That's what we have to do. God understands we go through things. He said we're going to go through trials and tribulations. He said we're going to meet the enemy in full force, just like that. But as soon as we see him, we should rebuke it. As soon as it happens, we should turn it down. Amen. We should rebuke it right then and say, Lord, forgive me. Sometimes we want to hold on to it. Bitterness, hurt, anger, hate. Sometimes we hold on to it and it festers up. It's like an old boil on your leg. The more it sits there, the bigger it gets. And it festers and it gets more infected. The more we have to go to the doctor and figure out what to do with it. And then it's bad when he has to fix it. But I've got, I've got all this off one verse and I ain't, even, I ain't even started reading what I want to read here. But I'm, I'm telling you, God wants us to look out there and see what the devil's coming at us with. Yes. I know why he's coming at me. we got this revival coming. He's coming at me because of that revival. And he's coming at me hard to fight me for everything it's worth. And sometimes, I'm just human. Sometimes I give him what he says. But later, the Holy Spirit says, Look, come back to me. Come back to me. And as I read these things, I want y'all to listen a little bit. And I'm going to start reading it. I'm going to show about what I'm talking about. But I'm going to say what God's Word says. It says, number two, it says, For the law of the Spirit is life in Christ Jesus and made free from the law of sin and death. But what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh for sin condemned sin in the flesh. See there? That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but that they are of the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And when we get out of the walk with God, we walk out of peace. Yes. We walk in death. We're not walking in the peace of God. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I think that's something you said this way, wasn't it? You spoke that this way. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And he is none of his. Think about that. See, God came to me after I got in my place. And that was wrong. And He told me I was wrong. And I had to repent. I have to say, Lord, forgive me. I think we all go through these things. Yes. We? Every day sometimes. Yes. We're only human. Our flesh is weak. But in the Spirit, we're strong. We have to stay in the Spirit. We have to walk in the Spirit, be in the Spirit, speak in the Spirit. 
It's a must in our lives today as a Christian, as a walking man of God, as a walking man or woman of God. We have to walk in that spiritual walk. Sometimes it's hard. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. And the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead <coughs> shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwells in you. He's going to quicken us. Think about that. I want you to turn over to um, Romans 8 and 28 now. So that we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Mm. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestine to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be firstborn among many brethren. Yeah. Moreover, <laughs> whom He did predestine them, He also called, and whom He called, them he also justified and to them he justified he also glorified Amen. what shall we then say to these things if God be for us who can be against us yes. he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all how shall he not with him also freely give us all things salvation right there who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect it is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Yes. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or perils, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors yes. for him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, yes. nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything created shall be able to separate us from the love of God, yes. which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. See, once you have that spiritual awakening, once you have that, as he was talking a moment again, once you get saved, you have a spiritual awakening. And if you truly I've been awakened other than speaking just the words in the sinner's prayer. You know Christ, and He knows you. Yes. And if you, you do something wrong, He comes back and He corrects us. See, yes. that's the thing. is Most people don't receive correction. They just let it go. And that sin builds up in their lives. And they walk out of the will of God. Yes. Amen. I want you to turn now. To Second Timothy one and nine it says, "Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to His own purpose of grace, which is given to us by Jesus Christ before the world began? But it is now made manifested by the appearance of the Savior Jesus Christ, who has." abolished death and has brought life and immortality to the light through the gospel. Think about what that says. Brought life, not death. When we get saved, we get life. There is no more death. Alright, you heard that, didn't you? Amen. Amen. There's something here I want you to see. Now, I was, I've been... Looking, Pastor Jay and them been talking about Revelations 3. I looked that up, but something told me to look that up this morning. I want to read 
Revelations 3 and 2. I know they were, he was talking about the, the church of Sardis. But this next scripture, one, brings that out. But two, look what it says. And I think this pertains to everybody else out here. It says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, that ye are ready to die, for I have found thy work perfect before God. Amen. Yes. Amen. Oh, I felt that. Oh, He's found our works perfect for God. Yes. To not walk in that way is to walk in death. Is to lose your salvation. If we get into sin and continue in sin, it's kind of like a separation from God. If we continue to walk in that sin or, or the things in our life, we get farther and farther and farther away from God. And there's a cloud over our head. We're starting to walk in no blessings. Start to walk in no hope. To walk in fear. That sounds like things that people walk in that aren't saved, isn't it? Yes. Pass me not. Pass me not. Pass me not, oh Jesus. See, all these, all these songs and even what you spoke this morning, all these things were in these songs. Did I know what they were speaking or singing the song on this morning? No. But God knew. All yeah. these scriptures He was quoting. Man, I'm looking like, well, what's this scripture got to do with that scripture here, Lord? You know, I'm sitting going through this. I'm, going, I'm thinking, Lord, this thing's going all over the place here. But I want you, want you to know we're in this for a reason. We're in this with Him for a reason. To show others about Jesus Christ. And even though we go through the hardest times sometimes, even though we go through times we feel like giving up, God shows up. He says, hey, I'm here. Aren't you thankful today that God is always right there with us? Amen. Aren't you thankful today He doesn't let us go over the edge? Yes. Because who can take us away from the love of God? No one. Because He has us in His hands. Yes. Right? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for keeping us. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for showing us. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for just being with us this yes. day. Because I am truly thankful to you, Lord. Amen. I think now we're going to have Pastor Kathleen. Don't give the thing. I will say, welcome everyone from California, Africa, all around the world. May the Lord richly bless you today. We pray the blessings of all of you. And pray this day is the day the Lord has made for you yes. in a certain and unique way. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. I was just going to mention uh, we have three offerings. This week, just from California alone. Amen. So, we're a global ministry. We're an international ministry. Amen. And we give God the glory. Yes. For uh, whether we're small or big here, it doesn't, really doesn't matter. You know, we're online and people are watching what we're doing. And the Lord is touching people to bless what we're doing. Amen. So, we give Him the glory for it. Yes. It's not our work. It's not us. We, we, we have no reason to be proud. We boast in the Lord. Right. Amen. Amen. So let me boast in the Lord. <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you for this, these offerings that have been truly inspired by you, Lord. People knowing that we are reaching out to feed our African friends. At this time... Food is the major ordeal in Africa, Lord. And we are doing all that we can do to help our friends in Africa with food. And there should be no other things that are important at this time except the sustaining of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
this thing. Our special will bring in our message. It, it may not seem like a direct way to bring it in, but you could say it's bringing it in directly and in conjunction with everything that we have thus far said today. I will rise. Yes, There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed. The victory is won. He is risen from the dead. And I will rise when he calls my name. No. For my God, fall on my knees and rise. Oh, boy. Oh, I feel the Spirit. There's a day that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light. And the shadows disappear And my face shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome And the grave is overwhelmed The victory is won He is ready
Amen. Right now, as we speak, there are angels around the throne of God saying, Worthy is the Lamb. Holy, holy, holy. I think it's interesting. The songwriter said, Because He rose. When Jesus called His name, He rose. He could hear the angels. He could hear those angels saying, Worthy is the Lamb. And then when he looked out in his own community and he looked around everybody that was around him, he could hear it in the spirit that those longing hearts were crying for the worthiness of the Lamb. That's what this message is about today. Is being able... Being able to sense and to feel what our commission is and what we're to do. And knowing what's going on in the hearts of people and what's going on in heaven. Yes. Because we have decided to rise to the occasion. Now, That's not the name of the message. That's not the title of the message. But that's pretty much where this message is going to end up by the time we get to the end of it. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to look at John chapter 1. We've been studying John. It's taken us three months to get through four chapters. Maybe 2021 will be the year of John. I don't know. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 13. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing has made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light, and all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe. In his name. Who were born. Not of blood. Nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. But of God. Amen. Our father in heaven. I pray that as we speak over these inspired words. Found in your word. The Bible. That the Holy Spirit will take total control. That you will speak, Father, loud and clearly to our responsibility as light bearers, to our responsibility as ministers, to our responsibility as a ministry. And what it is that we're to be doing. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing. I thank you, Father, for for being faithful and sending your Spirit to minister to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a true story about a plastic surgeon who had a patient that had been injured in a fire. 
This patient had attempted to save his parents from a burning house, but he couldn't get in in time, and so his parents died. His own face was burned and disfigured, and as sometimes happens when overwhelmed by such tragedy, the man felt guilty because he failed to save his parents. And he believed that his pain was God's punishment. So as a result of this, he refused help from anyone, including the doctor. And he wouldn't let anyone see him, not even his wife. When the wife went to talk with the doctor, he told her, I can restore his face. But of course, the problem was that he repeatedly refused treatment and the doctor wasn't sure what to do. The wife looked at the physician and she said, that's why I've come to see you. I want you to disfigure my face so that I can be like him. If I can share his pain, Amen. then maybe he will let me back into his life. Our text today tells us that God had a similar problem. The Gospel of John starts out by introducing us to Jesus. We're told that Jesus was what? The Word of God. In fact, He wasn't just the Word of God. He was God. He was God in the flesh, incarnate. But then we're told that there's this problem. What we read in verses 10 and 11, Jesus was in the world and the world was made through him, yet, here's the problem, the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. Amen. Now, why wouldn't they receive Him? Why would these people not want Jesus? Well, the answer is revealed. Just a few verses earlier, look what was said in verse 4 and 5. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines, where? In the darkness. Now darkness is normal at night. It's normal. I like darkness. I can turn the lights off and sleep. But darkness is a good time to rest. But it's extended lengths of darkness can start messing with your mind. In Alaska, the nights can go on for, for well days. There's a city called Barrow. It's the city furthest north in Alaska. And there, the nights can go on for 67 days straight. And what they have found is that many of people who live in Alaska suffer from something called SAD. SAD, yeah. Acronym for Seasonally Affected Disorder. It's a disorder where people suffer from depression. Because they have been in the dark for so long. I think it's probably medically a vitamin D deficiency. That's what I think it is, but I'm not a doctor. Now realizing how much this affects people, neuroscientists at the University of Pennsylvania experimented with rats, keeping them in the dark for six weeks. They found that the animals not only exhibited depressive behavior, but they also suffered damage in the brain regions known to be underactive in humans during depression. In the same way, SAD causes depression in people who've been in dark places way too long. It robs them of their enthusiasm. It robs them of their hope. It robs them of their joy. It yes. robs them of their pleasure. Now, God knows that. He knows it. 
And so when God talks about the true darkness in people's life, He uses darkness to describe the effect that sin has in their lives. For example, in Colossians chapter 1 verse 13, it says, He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us uh, or transferred us, as some translations say, into the kingdom of the Son of His love. In Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8, we're told, For you were once in darkness, but now you are in light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. If you look a few verses down at verse 11 and 12, it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. And then in Acts chapter 26, verse 18, Paul said that Jesus had commissioned him to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So you see, sin created darkness in our world. The darkness of our sins. And that darkness has robbed us of God's love. Do you remember in the book of Genesis? Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden and it seems that God would regularly come down and walk with them and talk with them. Remember that? That's where the writer of the old gospel hymn got the idea for his song. Sing it with me. I've come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear My ear, the Son of God discloses And He walks with me and He talks with me and He tells me I am His own And the joy we share as we tarry How wondrous it would have been to have been Adam and Eve. Yes. Beautiful garden. A pristine world. And God spending time with you. Yes. You didn't have to go to Him. He comes to you. Can you imagine that? Walking and talking like you are the most important person in the world. But it didn't last for Adam and Eve, did it? No. They ate of the fruit. They realized they had sinned. They tried covering their nakedness with leaves. And God came and showed up. That's the title of this message. And Jesus showed up. Amen. And what did Adam and Eve do then? When God showed up, Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, what did Adam and Eve then do? They hid. They heard the sound of the Lord, it says here in Genesis 3, 8, walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They went hiding in the bushes. And people have been hiding from God ever since. Amen. That's why John 1 verse 11 tells us, He came to His own and His own did not receive Him. They were hiding. They knew their sin. And their sin made them uncomfortable about Jesus. Now to be fair... Everybody is just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Every one of us. 
We all know we have sinned, and so our first impulse is always try to do what? Cover our sin. Put the leaves on. Yes. That's always, that's always the first impulse. But somehow everyone realizes deep inside that their leaves just aren't cutting it. They're not covering it. We may think that our leaves can make it so God won't notice our sin, but when God gets too close to us, we can get very uncomfortable. And before we became Christians, we may not have wanted anything to do with Him. We may not have believed that God loved us as we were. That's why John tells us his own did not receive him. Those folks had gotten used to covering their sins with makeshift leaves. Some have tried to cover their nakedness with religious behavior by their good deeds and their righteous attitudes. Folks like the Pharisees thought that their own self-righteousness would cover up their own failures. But then Jesus showed up. Yes. And they rejected him. Some folks, like the priests, thought that their bloodlines and their influence were powerful people who would impress God. I mean, they were priests after all, right? What you talking about? I'm of the Aaronian priesthood. You have these uh, um, Hebrew supporters today who are that way. They get all in a. They they, they, they want to tell you I'm from the bloodline of Judah. And, and amen. You're not my Messiah. And, and amen. <laughs> that doesn't make you closer to God because you're of His bloodline, right? He ble- He don't have no blood anymore. He bled all His out. Amen. He don't have your right. blood. Our sin. Yes. Right. So why why are you getting all you know? Pompous over, over. oh, I, I'm actually a Jew from the tribe of Judah. It doesn't mean anything. Amen. But these priests, even back then, they had their religious titles, they had their garments. And what did these garments do? It kept them covered. covered. But then Jesus showed up. Yeah. And what did they do? Rejected him. But there were many folks who just didn't even bother thinking God would care for them. They were losers anyway. Sinners. Prostitutes. Tax collectors. And they believed that God wouldn't want them. So why bother pretending that they could cover their sin? But then Jesus showed up. (laughs) Do you know why Jesus spent... All his time focusing on those sinners and tax collectors and people who didn't think they were worthy. They were the only ones not hiding behind their fig leaves. Amen. Amen. These folks had never thought they were fooling God. These folks knew They walked in darkness and they hungered for the light. They were the only ones who didn't reject Jesus because He didn't reject them. Yes. 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 Amen. But now the folk who did reject Jesus, the religious and the self-righteous, did so because of their sins. Their sins had cut them off from the love and forgiveness of God. They knew God hated sin, and so the idea that God would love them anyway was tough to accept. They were uncomfortable around Jesus because they were really uncomfortable around God. That's why they did all the stuff that they did. That's why they tried to be sinless on their own merit. That's why they clung to their religious behavior. And titles and clothing. They hoped that God would see their leaves and be pleased. And then He wouldn't notice the sin that they had beneath. That's what they hoped. 
And that worked. It all worked until Jesus showed up. Yes. It's kind of like when you're driving down the road. You know that the speed limit is 60 miles an hour, but you're in a kind of a hurry and everybody else is driving faster, so you do too. You've set the cruise control, you're listening to the radio, you're talking to your spouse, having a good time, you feel comfortable, you're at ease. All is right in the world, but then you see the police car sitting off on the side of the road up there. What do you do? You hit that brake. You get a little nervous. Suddenly your sin is obvious. And you know you're doing wrong, right? Well, in the same way, when people see, see God setting off on the side of the road, they realize they're doing wrong, so they try to avoid Him. Someone once said, some people can't find Jesus the same way a thief can't find a policeman. That is why people can't find Jesus. Their sins make them uncomfortable, and so they try to avoid Him, just like a thief would try to avoid the police. Years ago, songwriter Billy Joel, actually he's a singer as well, said this about his experience at church. He said, there's a guy nailed to a cross in dripping blood. Everyone's blaming themselves for that man's torment. But I said to myself, forget it. I had no hand in that evil. I have no original sin. There's no blood of any sacred martyr on my hands. I'll, I pass on all of this. You know what Billy Joel's problem was? His problem was without the guy nailed to the cross, Billy Joel didn't have a prayer. Amen. He has no way to deal with his sin. You see, there's a lot of people who think that God is setting up speed traps. Like Billy Joel. They think that this Christianity thing is all about God won't waiting by the side of the road, waiting to catch them in their sin and write them out a ticket to hell. But that's not what Jesus is all about. We've all heard John 3.16. In fact, repeat it with me. For God loved so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and so whoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Alright. Now, you've heard that. But can you quote the next verse? Verse 17. Most folks don't even know what verse 17 says. Verse 17 says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might, it didn't say it would be, might, because that's contingent on them, might be saved through Him. You see, Jesus didn't come to condemn us and destroy us. He came to salvage us. Yes. Amen. You ever owned a car that had a salvage title? Yes. Yes. It still worked, right? Yes. But when you tried to sell it, you didn't get that much for it. Because people don't consider salvage valuable. But Jesus... Yes. There's not a soul in his church that's not salvaged. And we are the apple of his eye. Amen. You see, Jesus came to bring out our darkness. To restore us to God's love. Now how did he do that? How was he able to salvage us? How was he able to restore us and bring us back to his love? I'll tell you how. It's in your, found in your Bible. Philippians chapter 2. In fact, if you have your Bible, please open to this and look at it directly from the Word. You can hear this, but I think it's more powerful if you actually see it in the Word. Philippians chapter 2. And verse six, is six through 8. I'm going to kind of start in midstream here. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. 
Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Like Jesus, or Jesus came to earth to suffer just as we suffer. To feel pain just like we feel pain. He came to earth to be just like us. Is that sounding familiar to a story I told a few minutes ago? You remember the story at the beginning? A man felt guilty because he believed that he had failed his parents. And his guilt shut him off from any form of help or love. Do you remember, remember what his wife asked the doctor? She said, I want to, to, you to disfigure my face so that I can be like him. If I can share in his pain, then maybe he'll want me back in his life. Remember that? Yes. Now, of course, the doctor refused to do that. But that doctor was so moved by her love that the doctor came to his house and went and knocked on his bedroom door. He called loudly. I'm a plastic surgeon and I want you to know that I can restore your face. There was no response. So he called out again, please come out. And again, there was no answer. Then still speaking through the door, the doctor explained what the wife had wanted him to do. She wants me to disfigure her face like yours and hope that you will let her back into your life. That's how much she loves you. There was a brief moment of silence. And then slowly, the doorknob began to turn. That is the same story of God reaching down to folks like you and me. He became like us in hopes that we would yes. let Him into our lives. Yes, Lord. That's how much He loved us. But there's a lot of people that don't want to get too close to God. Because they don't want to risk having their sins revealed in His presence. They, they may be good at covering up their guilt and their shame, but all the same, they had just as soon not risk it. So what did they do? They continued be staying damaged and deformed by their sin because they can't imagine that God would love them so much to forgive their past. And the only person who may be able to convince them is someone like you or me who has experienced his healing firsthand. Yes. Yes, if we have come to Jesus, we are a Christian, born again Christian. We all have realized that God could fix what was damaged in our lives. And so over the years, we started out real zealous and on fire. Trying to talk to Jesus and every person who would take, just, just look at us. We'd jump in and say something. But over the years, that first love waxes cold sometimes. We've become a Christian undercover. Yes. 
We go through the routines. We come to church. We give what time and effort that we think is reasonable. We do what is asked of us, but there's no real motivation from within to go above and beyond what we can do to help people out there. Yes. How many of us actually have taken the time to go and knock on all our neighbors' doors and say, look, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and I love you. And I want to know if you're saved. And if not, is there anything I can do to help you become saved? Our own neighbors. We're commanded Amen. by Jesus to love God with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength and do what? Number two, love our neighbor as ourself. Are we knocking on our neighbor's doors? It's not about inviting them to church because we want to get numbers up. No. Just go talk to them and see if, they, if they're saved. Can I pray for you? Are you, you got a you you got a heart condition with God and you 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 you're mad? Let me let me see if I can share some scriptures with you and let you see the see that there's another side to this story. Are we doing that, or do we live in a neighborhood and we don't even know any of our neighbors' names? Imagine getting to heaven and realizing the people we saw every day walking their dog and going to the mailbox are not even there. And the Lord might look at us and say, I'd have had a lot more up here with you if you had been doing your job. Amen. Think about that. We have to be motivated to go above and beyond. It's not like Pastor Jeff said a few moments ago. It's not about doing things in the flesh and what the flesh and what, what might be reasonable in the flesh. Right. Let me tell you something. If you are operating in the Holy Spirit, you're going to be radical and you're going to do things that people are going to think, you kill, you, you kill yourself doing that if you're doing it in the Spirit. Because the Spirit's going to empower you to go above and beyond. Amen. And you know what? You're going to be protected every step of the way when you're yes. doing it because you're doing it in the Spirit. Yes. Amen. That's something we have to really consider. Many times we're motivated to do what we want to do. My father always said that people will do what they want to do. Now, he always said it, and I wondered why does he always say that? In other words, if they don't want to do it, they're not going to do it. It doesn't matter. God Himself came down in the flesh and said, do it. Well, I don't want to. I'm not going to do it. People are going to do what they want to do. That's what they're motivated by. But remember, if we're a Christian, we have been called to do something other than what we want to do. And we have to keep that in mind. You know what happens to the church? And I'm, you know, this is kind of a, a revival pep rally talk. Because this is what the things that we're going to address in our revival. Like we talked about with the, the, the Pharisees and the priests, our Christianity becomes our fig leaf. Yes. Think it about does. it. it does. Our Christianity becomes our fig leaf. That's what we cover our guilt and our shame with. Oh, I go to church and I do this, so now, now I don't have to feel bad about, you know, people don't have to know about what I really am and who I really am. Because what really happens is when that love has waxed cold, our relationship with God has become distant. And whenever Jesus shows up, what do we tend to do? We get out of Dodge. That's what we do. Pastor Jeff has a, another engagement to go to. We don't want to hear anything that the Holy Spirit may convict in our heart. We're neither hot nor cold. What ends up happening in many of the churches all around here, and I pray not here, is all we're, all we're doing is a person who takes up space in the pew. That's what happens. 
That is why we are partnering with Cross Connected Church and doing a three day revival in September in the park. There's too many folks around here who seem to be too complacent. I'm afraid that could even happen here, as I just mentioned. And here's something we have to be careful of. We're, we've got a ministry that we're doing here. And we got a ministry that we're doing in other parts of the world. But even what we are doing right now can become a form of complacency. Oh, well, I'm already busy doing this and I don't really need to do anything else. Well, we have to remember our as ministers we may be called to go out and do things in other countries, and we do that. But if we're still planted where we live, where we're at here, we still have a ministry obligation where we're planted. Remember a couple of weeks ago when we had our prayer and fast, and I said, you know, we need to stay in a season of prayer and fasting? We're entering re revival. We need to be seeking God really strong right now. We need God. What are you going to do with it? If, if we go to this revival and, and 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 five or six people get on fire and and they need help and they need counseling, they need direction. Lord, we need you to be able to your spirit to come in and and show us what to do, how to do it, how not to offend, how not to become overbearing or overpowering. We need to be seeking God on every step of this direction. It's just like a person who uh, praying for food, a miraculous provision of food, and then all of a sudden the next day they got a whole garage full of it and don't know what to do with it. Right? So I'm, be careful what you ask God for. But after we've asked God for it and we see that it might be coming, we need to pray and continue to fast on, Lord, let us do this the way you want it to be done. So that we're not operating in the flesh and what we're doing does not become a catastrophic failure. Our success is not our human wisdom or our good looks or our charm. Or our success is not just our favor. Our success is the powerful hand of God working in everything we're doing. And the only way we're going to have that support, the only way it's going to happen, is we're praying and fasting and seeking the face of God for it. Right now, in the season that we're in, at least until this revival is over, we should be in every church service we can be in. Being around people, being around the Spirit, being around spiritual activity. It's not a time to be playing. It's a time to be fasting and praying, seeking God. And it's not just, I'm going to go to this gathering over here, or I'm going to go to this, you know, I'm going to Bible study tonight. It's not just so that, okay, I'm there to feed myself. Right now, while you're seeking God, He very well may use you to feed someone else there that needs it. When we are seeking God and telling the Lord to use us, it is to no avail if all we do is sit at home and never go anywhere. We have to go out, make avail ourselves to the opportunity, and God will use us in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. We need to be seeking God in everything right now. I don't know how the other pastors in this ministry feel personally. I know that we have that ministry. We have a ministry in Africa. Uh, we did have a ministry that we helped, uh, helped with in Thailand. And uh, we've caught wind that they're, they're in some dire need. And we're praying and seeking the Lord regarding that. But I feel a conviction with the Lord 
that us leaving California was not just to get out of the craziness. I think we, the Lord directed this, guided it, and made it possible because this area in particular is in desperate need for help. What is supposed to be the next generation of the church, too many people are bound to the chains of something that they're addicted to. There is no future for the church if, this, if, the, if the world's going to last another 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Our next generation is hurting. The ones that the older ones hand the church over to, that next generation is hurting. Because too many people are addicted to something. They don't know what being born again it means. They're too reliant on their own selfishness and their own stupidity. They don't fear God. And I think that's why we were called to come back. I was called to come back to North Carolina and bring my family with me. Because there's a need right here in this city. And I think we, this church, because we're aware of it, and we've never been afraid to address anything, we need to start addressing it and seeing what we can do to help this, the people here. Yes, we do have this mission in Africa that we're going to continue to support and continue to work on, but we also have a mission right here in our own backyard and if we take that command seriously, love your neighbor as yourself, we need to help save our neighbor. Once we save our neighbor, we've got a larger army to help the world missions. More resources, more people, and more heart. We can't let our own neighbors die in their own sin. We needed to go out here and show the love of Christ. Jesus is getting ready to show up. Oh, he's getting ready to show up in revival. We know that. But he's, he's also getting ready to show up when he cracks that sky. And when he does, we should have no reason to feel afraid or ashamed. So let's prayerfully consider our responsibility as ministers of the gospel. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that we will take this all to heart. You spoke this loud and clearly to me. I'm praying, Father, that as others hear it and as they go into the book of John and as they go into their words, that you'll speak the same thing to them. We have an obligation to America, Father. Too many people are complacent. They put more faith in the government than they put into you. Use us, Father, to waken people up. And even some of the people who go to church every Sunday, who are just using their Christianity as a cover, I pray, Father, that you'll put us in line with those people and we'll be able to minister to them they will begin to open up their eyes and understanding. And they'll begin to realize there's no reason for us to be quiet. There's no reason for us to be slack. There's no reason for any of these things now, Father. We need to be ready. Like the virgins with full oil in our lamps. And ready to fire those lamps up whenever we have that opportunity. Use us, Lord. Bless us, Lord. For everyone listening in, bless them, touch them, touch their needs, touch their spirit. If the things that we ministered to today affects any of them, Father, help them to remove that fig leaf. Help them to come out. Help them to be convicted. But help them, Father, to abound in your spirit 
and go out and do the work you have commissioned us to do. I pray the same for every soul here and for every soul connected to this ministry. I pray, Father, for our own physical needs, our own physical provisions. When you bless, Father, it's for the purpose of blessing others. That's your purpose in blessing us. That's why you, you, you entrust things to us as faithful stewards. So help us, Father, to always be faithful in how we use our resources. And help us, Father, to go forward and look for ways to bless as many people as we can with the resources you have given. We love you so much. We thank you, Father. And we pray your blessing and your peace upon each and every one of us. The work we do is an honored work. It's not an easy work. But we know, Father, that when we go forth and we're ridiculed and persecuted for it, we have every reason to rejoice. Because then we are sharing in the same suffering that our Lord had. And we know that you are not unrighteous as to forget any of that. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for your love. We are indeed indebted to you in every way. There's nothing that we can do without you. There's no success. There's no, there's, there's absolutely no, um, anything, Father, that we can do on our own merits that can bring about uh, complete joy, complete satisfaction, and a complete fulfillment. It only comes in you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.